So this past week, uh, Pastor Jim was able to drive up to Chico and he actually got access into paradise. You can have a seat if you're standing. And so uh, as you know that that entire city has been leveled, but there's a few remaining structures. And, and one of the structures remaining is one of our sister churches, Paradise Alliance Church, is actually still standing there. And so uh, for some reason, yeah, thankfully that it's, it's still standing, but it's like all the people that go to that church, their houses are gone. So it's kind of like, okay, God, what are you doing here? I know there's a reason why it's still standing. But um, I want to show you a quick video that Pastor Jim made as a kind of a report of what's going on there. Hi, Bridge Church. This is Pastor Jim. I'm up in Paradise, California. It's Monday, Veterans Day, uh, and we're here checking out uh, how we can help and also partner with Hope City at some point. But uh, we're at our sister church, Paradise Alliance Church, which miraculously survived the fire. You can see the bushes down, down here burned all the way up to the, basically the front of the church. But as you pan across the, the way there, you'll see that the church is intact. There's also a Baptist church across the street, which is intact. So those are, those are two great things. And we want to continue to, to um, bless the, the people here at Paradise in any way we can, obviously being able to relate uh, in, a, in a very tangible way. Uh, yesterday, uh, church, uh, we were very generous, and we had a, were able to bring $2,000 worth of gift cards up here, dropped them off at the Chico Neighborhood Church, which is another sister church of ours. Uh, Billy and, and several others from the church are up actually at Chico Neighborhood Church right now, helping the shelter uh, with things that they need help with. So anyway, I just want to say thank you, and we want to continue to pray for the not only Paradise Alliance Church, but obviously the people of Paradise, as it's a, an overwhelming task. There are some buildings in the town that did survive, uh, but it's still a, it is like the reports say, it's, it's uh, by far the majority of the town has been destroyed. So pray they have hope, pray that the resources come their way, and pray that they're able to um, work through all of the very difficult uh, decisions they have to make in not, not just the next week or two weeks, but as we know, in the several months and years ahead as well. So anyway, thank you again, church, and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, continued generosity, and we can look forward to seeing Paradise getting back on their feet um, in, the, in the months and years to come. Thank you. Yeah, so I, obviously that church is going to turn into a hospital for hurting people in the, in the months and years to come. But, uh, you know, so a team of us went down on Monday. I invited the church. I said, if you want to come with us, meet at 830 at the church. We had 15 people show up. We had a, a few other people who just came and just gave gift cards for us to send down there. And we got to... Um, neighborhood Church in Chico, which is an alliance church, you know, and if, if you're new here, we're uh, part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance denomination, and so we have churches all over the place that we're connected to, and we get to the church, and literally, they're fine. They, they have, like, enough volunteers there, and so we've got this team of 50, and we're, or 15, and we're, like, chomping at the bit, let's go, and so as we were driving into Chico, we noticed that there was in the Walmart parking lot, maybe you've seen this on the news, there are tents set up all over the place. And so it's no joke. We go in there and people are living out of their tents. People are occupying a space, a parking space, and that has now become their home. And so people are living out of their cars and people are setting up cots and stuff. And we just went around and we just said, you know what, what we're gonna do is we're not gonna tell our story. We're just gonna open it up for them to tell their story. And it was actually kind of good because I had a mask on and it's the best, I was like the best listener I've ever been. I'm not kidding you. I'm thinking I should probably counsel with a mask on because I end up <laughs> speaking too much when I'm counseling. But it was, it was great. But you know what? It was so sad. Like there was a little, little two week old baby and mother's there holding the two week old baby. They don't have a home anymore. You know, stuff like that. And you go, man, and we're going to be talking about suffering today. And we're talking about suffering and having perspective and when things just going, you know, you get into a situation where you're like, I cannot believe we're here. But as we move into our series, Confidence, we're looking at the chapter of Romans 8. And we're, every verse in Romans 8 is all about confidence. And the first week we talked about in Romans 8, chapter 1, that therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we started off 
going like, let's get rid of the guilt and the shame because that's something that can really hinder our confidence. And then last week, we talked about this concept that God is a father who loves you more than you could ever imagine. And so there's some encouraging things as we move into today's verses. We're going to start in verse 18, but we're going to look at this concept of of suffering. And the title for today's message is uh, How to Move Forward After My World Stops. Moving forward after my world stops. We all encounter those moments when your world stops and you can't keep moving forward. What does that look like for you? Maybe for you, it's depression. And you've experienced this depression and it leaves you totally paralyzed. For you, it's disease. It's hearing about a loved one or maybe yourself, you get that report back and it's cancer. Others of you have lost someone who you love greatly and as a result of that, it's hard to move forward in the midst of that. Maybe uh, there's, a, there's people here, we're at Bridge Coffee Park, we're right in the middle of a natural disaster just last year and maybe you experienced that natural disaster and it took the wind out of your sails and your world stopped and it's hard to move forward. For others of you, maybe it's the death of a dream and you've been working hard and you've been looking forward to what you thought your plan was and then that dream gets shattered and now you go, how do I keep going forward. That was the Apostle Paul. As we read in Romans chapter 1, his dream, his dream was to go to Rome, which was the most influential city in the world. Why? Because he wanted to preach in the Colosseums. He wanted to preach to the most influential city in the world so that he can reach the most amount of people. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that he is continually hindered from going to Rome. And he's writing in Corinth, And he's writing to the church at Rome and he's saying, I'm going, but I just keep getting hindered from going to you guys. And he writes these words and he writes in Romans chapter eight. What what I really want to do is I want to give you guys four ways to keep moving forward when when your world stops. Okay? Four ways to keep moving forward when your world stops. And if you're taking notes, the first one is this that you need God's positive perspective. God's positive perspective. If you have a Bible or an iPad or a phone, or you can just read off the screen, but the the verses are in your notes in your program. Verse 18, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Now, Circle those words, nothing compared. uh, Nothing compared. The New Testament is originally written in the Greek language. And so that phrase there literally means to do the math or to calculate. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've never been good at math. In fact, I remember when I was in high school, I'm in ninth grade, I'm in algebra class, and I said these words, like some of you know, you're going to relate with me. I said, why do we have to take math? We're never going to use math in the real world. Has anybody ever said that? I know that there's some here like, I love math. There's some of you crazies that you love math. I get it. You love, Brand, you love, or or, uh, Abby, you love math? Is there anybody else here that, let's just go ahead. We got a math teacher back here. Thank you, Michelle. Sorry about that. I'm offending like half the church. Can, Can I get some love from the people that don't like math? Thank you. All right, good. Wait, I screwed it up. You're not even cussing in church. What's going on? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, the deal is algebra is different than math. Math people love. Algebra people hate. Okay, okay. So it was algebra. Yeah, so and, and it's very organized math, and you just know me. I'm not very organized. However, I open up the... This is math in an equation that I can get my head around. Like nothing compared. Here's the math that the Bible's talking about. All the suffering that you experience is like 0.0000000001 of your eternal existence. And that's, but there's a 
99.9999% of eternity that we're going to spend with God after we live on this earth. Isn't that good perspective? Isn't that good math? I'll take that any day. Like, but it feels like an eternity when we're in the moment suffering, doesn't it? And that's why we have to keep going back to God's word to get that positive perspective to help us realize this is not our, our final destination. We were not created. We're like a fish out of water. We're just kind of flopping around here suffering. And God's saying, I've got an eternal home waiting for you. So you have to keep waiting for that. Now, verse 19, Paul says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will re reveal who his children really are. Verse 20, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Now, we have, the Bible talks about this idea of God's curse, that we live in this world that is broken and fallen. And many people will ask me, why is there so much suffering in the world? I mean, why are we experiencing, why, why does a fire come through and totally demolish a city? Why do we open up the news every single week now and we see about another shooting in a public arena? That didn't happen when I was a kid. Within, you know, like the, the years that I've been alive, we've seen just craziness and we go, God, why is this world so crazy? Why do bad things happen to good people? And the only answer I have for you is this, is because God loves us. When God created us, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them with this freedom to choose to love him back. Because what God could have been is he could have been a puppeteer. And he could have just kind of said, okay, Adam, you're going to love me. Eve, you're going to love me. But if there was no freedom in that love, that's not real love. That's called robotic. And it's not love at all. And so God gives Adam and Eve freedom of choice. And as a result of that, they rebel and they choose to disobey God. And as a result of that, sin entered into the world. So we live in what the Bible calls a fallen, broken humanity. And the reality is, is we can't explain all of the suffering. We don't even understand all the suffering. But what we know is that we do live in this broken world. And God still comes to this broken world to show how much he loves us. And he suffers more than we could ever imagine to draw us back into a relationship with him why? Because he loves us and he's constantly pursuing us even in the midst of this broken world. It's interesting in verse 22 of Romans chapter 8. And, and really quickly here, it's, um, he talks about this curse. And do you remember what Eve's curse was going to be in Genesis chapter 3? Maybe you don't. Pain and childbirth. Some of you know that. Some of you have experienced that. In verse 22, it, Paul uses the picture of childbirth to picture our world and where we're headed. For we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And so I remember when my wife was pregnant with our first, and she just had terrible pregnancies. She was she experienced morning sickness for five months, almost to the day with all of our kids, meaning she would get sick every single day for five months. And she goes, she learned that root beer was the only thing that kind of tasted good coming up. So she just would always be like, hey, could you go to the store and get root beer? I'm not kidding. And so uh, I remember she, she had, uh, what do you call it, edema, where you kind of swell. She had the sciatica thing going on. She was always just uncomfortable trying to get situated in bed and just couldn't sleep. I mean, just her, breath, her breathing was labor. Everything was just wrong with us. And she was completely miserable during the pregnancy. In fact, one day I came home and she's bouncing on one of these physio balls. Have you guys ever seen that? And I go, what are you doing like on this physio ball bouncing? And she goes, I heard that if you bounce on this ball, the baby will come out sooner. And so... I ran over and I started pushing her shoulders. I'm like, let's get this baby out. And then 
Finally, that water broke. And we're going to the hospital, and those birth pains start to come in. And I'm like, this is funny. Have you guys seen this? Um, these guys that try to act like, hey, I can handle the birth pains. And there are these videos, and they hook them up to the machines, and they, have to, they actually try to replicate a pregnancy. It's just funny. Go, on, go, go Google it. You'll just waste a bunch of time, but it's, it's funny. But anyways, so we get in there, and, the, and then the labor is difficult. But by her side the entire time was a compassionate Loving, caring, buffed nurse. And uh, it was, so, no, but I just remember, like, (laughs) no joke. She's not here right now. I went and took a nap because it was exhausting for me. And so, finally, but now, now think about all that suffering, all that misery, all that pain. But you know that as soon as our daughter came out and my wife was holding our daughter for the first time, all of that pain was forgotten. And what Paul is saying is that right now, it's like we're, we're in the labor pains in this world. But there's gonna come a day when we step into God's presence and into his glory in heaven and we will forget about this. Isn't that awesome to think about? Isn't it amazing to think that the best is yet to come? That, that there is groaning and sadness in this world, but that there's a day we're gonna experience joy and hope and just be able to experience God and his love and his presence? See, that's the kind of perspective that gives us confidence to keep moving forward even when our world stands still. The second thing you need in order to move forward when your world stands still is we need God's patient persistence. We need God's, it just, they all came to me in peace this week. They're they're gonna come to some some other letter next week, but uh, verse 23, and we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait in eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Verse 24, we were given this hope when we were saved. Now, if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And so we're in a season of our lives and just being here on this earth that we wait patiently and confidently. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you know that you're going to spend eternity with him. You've got that confidence, uh, confident assurance. But we don't get to experience all the blessing of that. We don't get to experience these bodies that, you know, Eli is not going to have to wake up and stretch because his back is all jacked up. And by the way, he didn't say it, but he wasn't going for a reverse layup. He was going for a reverse dunk. I mean, I'm just saying, he was was just kind of, but seriously, we don't, uh, my head can't even wrap around this idea of not having pain or feeling emotional pain. Like, I just don't even get it. And yet we look forward to that day when we will have no more pain and sadness and crying. Amen. As Paul writes these words, he talks about, if, if you're uh, taking notes, you can circle this phrase in verse 23, released from sin and suffering. Now, if there was anyone that would have want to be released from sin and suffering, it would be Paul. Paul's resume of suffering was quite impressive. And find, we find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. Now, listen to the Apostle Paul and what he goes through in his life, okay? I have worked harder. I've been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Why? Why 39? Because 40 would have probably killed them. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of all the churches. Man, is that impressive in terms of his suffering? Here's a guy who had more suffering than I've ever read about or understood, and yet he still had more hope than anyone that I've ever read about or understood. Now, is that amazing? I was talking with Pastor John Brown. He is the pastor of the Cambodian Alliance Church over there at uh, Bridge Santa Rosa. And he is a phenomenal Bible teacher. And as we were talking, he, he brought something up, and I've never seen this perspective before, but, but Paul had PTSD. Paul had post-traumatic stress disorder. And here's how we know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says to the Corinthian church, he says, I came to you with fear and trembling. Now, that's somebody that's gone through a ton of pain. And if you know what post-traumatic stress disorder is, it's where you have fear and trembling and anxiety. And you've got all of this stuff. You can't think clearly. Your, your brain's foggy. He experienced that. But you know the cool thing about the Apostle Paul? Is that he reframed his PTSD and he wasn't defined by it. And so many of you have experienced PTSD. I believe I've experienced PTSD. But let's reframe our PTSD into what Paul did. And this is what I would think. As I was studying, I was thinking, here's another acronym for PTSD. This is Paul's. Persevering through suffering disaster. We're gonna persevere through suffering disaster. And we're not gonna be defined by PTSD, we're gonna be defined what God's word says about us and the fact that we wait eagerly and hopefully and confidently for a savior. In fact, these are the words that Paul wrote in Romans chapter five, verses three and four. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. We can rejoice when we experience the suffering for we know that they help us uh, develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. You see the progression there? You got trials of suffering, that in increases our endurance, that endurance increases our character, and that character increases our hope. And I love what Helen Keller said. Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. I'm going to say that one more time. Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. And so in order to move forward when your world stands still, you need God's perspective, you need his patience, and you also need, number three, God's, does anybody want to take a stab at this? It's a P. Prayer partner. You need God's prayer partner. This is the one part of the Bible that's kind of a, a real mystery to me. As we read in verse 26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows, that the, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Do you understand this? The Holy Spirit, in those moments of your trial, in those moments that you are in so much pain that you can't even get the words out, that the Holy Spirit is pleading on our behalf and praying for us to the Father and according to his will. That is amazing. You know, one of the worst kind of sufferings is the suffering of being alone in your suffering. When you're suffering and you're suffering some sort of a, maybe uh, mentally 
or you're suffering emotionally or you're suffering physically and no one, you just go, no one understands my suffering and the feeling of being alone is almost worse than the actual suffering itself. And here's what the Bible is saying. You're never alone. You're never alone. Even when you feel like you're alone, God's spirit is interceding for you. I was thinking about this with my kids. There were times when my kids were growing up and you would see them get hurt. As a, as a father, I'd see them get hurt. And there would be, like their mouths would open, but nothing would come out. Do you remember those moments? It's like, it's like and then you knew there was gonna be like a scream coming really soon. <laughs> now, I knew as a father, I was gonna go, I knew they were in pain, right? I was gonna go and comfort them. It would be incredibly cruel for me as a parent to come alongside my child and say, now I want you to formulate a complete sentence to help me understand how you're feeling right now. Like, God doesn't do that with us. He doesn't wait for us to formulate a, a complete sentence when we're in that painful situation. He hears our groans. He sees our tears. He understands our depression and our confusion. And in those moments, we just can't even get the words out. He says, I know already. I love you. And that's why the Spirit is interceding on your behalf according to my will This is mind-blowing for me. And if you can get your mind around the fact that God loves you and he prays for you. Charles Spurgeon, an old-school theologian who I love to read, he writes these words. It is a mark of wondrous condescension that God should not only answer our prayers when they are made, but should make our prayers for us. Oh, we could end right here. We could end right now and just walk out of church and go, God's praying for us. We're not alone in their suffering. But we've got one more point. So number four is God's purpose and plan. If we want to move forward in those moments when our world stops, we got to understand and we need God's purpose and plan. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Paul knew all about this. And some of you are saying, well, Billy, that's great. That's a great verse. And people have even quoted that to me. But how is God going to work through the death of a loved one? Can he work through that? He can. How's God going to work through my child getting sick? He can work through that. How's he going to work through my depression? How's he going to work through uh, that betrayal and that person that I trusted and it broke my heart? How's he going to work through that? The Bible's saying that give it enough time, God's got a greater picture and a greater plan, and he's doing something beautiful in you. In the Japanese art of kintsugi, a broken pot is repaired with glue that is infused with gold dust. And so you have this glue and gold dust that is infused, and that's the glue that brings the pot back together so that once that pot is repaired or brought back together, the pot now has these veins of gold running through it. And as I look out, I see a lot of cracked pots there. But they, whatever your situation is, but God is infusing his gold dust. He's infusing his love and his healing and his plans and his purpose in, those gold, in that gold dust so that as he puts you back together, you are more beautiful than you were before you were broken. And we know that God is causing all things to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to to his purpose. You know what the goal of the Christian life really is? Is this next verse in verse 29. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn or that can be translated as supreme among many brothers and sisters. And so God is developing your character in the midst of your trials. 
You know, at the beginning, I talked about Paul. His dream was to go to Rome to preach the gospel there. Well, guess what? His prayer was answered, but not the way that he had planned on it. Paul ended up going to Rome, but he went to Rome in chains. And he was put in a jail cell, and he was chained to a Roman guard. Far from his plan and his dream to go preach to the masses in Rome. And God stopped Paul's world just long enough that he would write these four letters. He wrote a letter to the church at Philippi. He wrote a letter to the church at Colossae. He wrote a church to, letter, um, to the church in Ephesus. And then he writes a church to Philemon. And those become a large portion of the New Testament. God says, I'm going to get you in a jail cell, and I'm going to speak, and I'm going to literally breathe my words, and you're going to pen these words so that you're not going to just influence a little revival gathering where there might be thousands of people that are affected. I'm going to allow your word to influence people, cultures, over continents, for centuries, you're going to be influential with the words that you pen, the words that are God's words, for billions of people. Now, Paul had a good plan. Don't get me wrong. It just happened to be that God's plan was way better. And right now, some of you are being broken down of your own plans. And you're saying, God, I don't fully understand this. I don't know why this is happening to me. And God is just saying, wait, wait on me. Continue to trust me, to continue to put one foot in front of the other. And I am doing something that's much more beautiful than you can ever imagine. But we have to trust him. And then there's just those moments sometimes and we just have to go back to God's perspective and just say, you know what? We're suffering now for this time. We're in a broken world. We can't explain and try to analyze everything. What we have to do is we have to just keep our eyes and our hearts focused on the Savior. We just have to keep our eyes and hearts focused on our inheritance and on heaven. And that will give us the motivation to walk with confidence in the midst of suffering. So what is it for you? What has stopped your world? What has devastated you to the point where you're now paralyzed? God's saying no. And my power, keep moving forward and I'm gonna walk with you through this and I'm gonna create a beautiful tapestry, a beautiful story, a beautiful picture because I have a purpose and plan for your pain. Let's pray together. God, this is a scripture that we have to take by faith. And Lord, there are moments when we compare and we consider and we do the math and we calculate, God, the suffering that we experience on this earth compared to eternity. We just have to praise you and thank you, God, that there's a, there's a better to come. In fact, the best is yet to come. And that gives us hope. But I pray right now for that person who has maybe given up hope. A person right now that life has not only been a, a series, not only just one event that has stopped their world, but it's been a series of events that have stopped their world. And it feels overwhelming for them, Lord. Would you remind us in the moments when we don't even have the words to pray that your spirit intercedes for us in accordance with your will, Father. God, we praise you and we thank you that we're not alone. And I pray that you would give an overwhelming sense of comfort and an overwhelming sense of your hope in this place right now as we keep our eyes focused on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.